the school. Uh, the conversations in this uh, lecture series largely revolve around issues relevant to the major focus areas of the school, that is on international relations and national security, political economy and strategic languages. This lecture series endeavors to bring eminent personalities, including policymakers in government and opinion influencers from the wider strategic community to provide varied perspectives, thereby adding to the existing discourse on the subject. It will also act as a platform, hopefully for students from different areas of specialization to interact with one another, thereby enabling uh, interdisciplinary inquiry into research at the university. Among our speakers this far, and we've had about 12 rounds, uh, today's the 13th round, we've had distinguished practitioner, practitioners who've been serving in the highest levels of the government, including our current finance secretary, Dr. Somnathan, who physically visited us and spoke about uh, the current economic situation, particularly in the context of the COVID pandemic. The current Sri Lankan ambassador to India, Ambassador Morogoda, who spoke to us about the situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Adisha Secretary until recently in the Ministry of Commerce, Mr. Sanjay Chadda, who spoke to us on the trade imbalance and how India is adjusting to the current uh, situation when it comes to uh, trade um, and, and, and inflows, uh, especially post the COVID pandemic. Uh, the current NSAB member and the Director General of the China Center for Contemporary Studies, uh, the MEA, Lieutenant General Narsimhan. And of course, uh, among us, we have Ambassador Venkatesh Varma, who gave us a wonderful insight into Russia's national security management after having recently served there as our ambassador. Um, today, of course, uh, one more distinguished personality joins that list. Um, uh, we have a personal connect in the sense that uh, General Khandare is also an emeritus uh, resource faculty with the school. Um, uh, you know, and he's been very kind enough to give us uh, his inputs from time to time, and he'll continue to guide us as we move forward. The conversation that we'll have today is on an extremely pertinent topic because threats to national security are very dynamic and multidimensional from before. These threats have evolved from the traditional spheres, primarily revolving around protecting our external borders from outside powers and securing our internal environment from domestic challenges and vulnerabilities. To the non-traditional spheres, including rapid environmental changes, access, or I would say challenge to access to clean water and energy, and in particular, the rising use of asymmetric warfare, often supported by some states like Pakistan, in the pursuit of their narrow and warped objectives. In this context, governments around the world, and in particular in India, are increasingly aligning their resources across domains in an attempt to evolve a comprehensive approach towards addressing national security challenges. So to deliberate this in detail, we are extremely honored and delighted to have such a distinguished expert to interact with us. Uh, just briefly on General Khandare, I mean, among his many, many achievements in the last 40 odd years of his professional life, General Khandare until recently was the military advisor in the National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office advising the National Security Advisor. Uh, this was until October 2021. He's currently associated with the Ministry of Defense. Prior to his, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, tenure at the NSCS, he was Director General Defense Intelligence Agency and the Deputy Chief of the Integrated Defense Staff uh, until uh, January 2018. He uh, has vast experience, as I mentioned, handling military affairs and, is, and has been involved uh, for a number of years in advising the apex level on decision making based on analysis and assessments 
impacting national interests. He has first-hand experience of dealing with China on the LAC, with Pakistan on the LOC, and encountering terrorism in the hinterland of JNK and in the Northeast region. He has enhanced synergy between technical and human intelligence at tactical, operational, and strategic level. He's an expert in capability and capacity enhancement, including Atmanirbhar mission and defense diplomacy. He has synergized interministerial output related to security. He's an avid thinker in conflict prevention, management, and termination, as also in technology search and incorporation. So needless to say, of course, he's also a distinguished fellow uh, with the USI think tank in New Delhi, as he is an emeritus resource faculty with uh, our school at RRU. Having said this, I'd like now to, I mean, there are many, many other things I would obviously like to say, but we are all here to uh, listen to General Khandare. And I don't think I should take any more time. I'd like to once again, on behalf of uh, the school, the university, and this audience, which uh, General Khandare, you may be able to see, is quite varied. Um, would like to warmly welcome you, sir, and request you to take over. Thank you. Jehin to everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vinkit, for uh, such a generous introduction. And uh, I am especially honored to see Ambassador Venkatesh Verma, and I feel privileged to uh, be talking in front of you, sir. And uh, uh, let me uh, make it very clear in the beginning itself that my talk is more focused towards the students. And the idea is to simplify things about the uh, nebulous idea about security. Because anything and everything that can't be controlled gets clubbed under security, which is not the correct way of looking at a long-term planning and the current execution. Uh, if uh, we consider about security, uh, the age-old concept that territorial integrity or the physical security of it is essentially a military job, I think that is long, it has long undergone a change. And that is the reason why I uh, specifically insisted with Dr. Venkat that we should be talking about comprehensive national security. The Constitution would specify uh, the military job or the allocation of business rules would specify the job of military in terms of physical security. But today, when we look at the fifth generation war or the hybrid warfare or the gray zone warfare, uh, in the entire spectrum of security, uh, there is nothing which is uh, binary. Uh, and I would say the challenge today, which has to be met, is to have a whole of nation approach. Now, at places we would say that we are having a whole of nation approach, but I think I should take this opportunity in front of uh, such uh, a diverse kind of an audience to bring out what are the challenges and what should be the focus. Uh, the entire talk is with the hope of success that our future generation shall take it to the higher levels of ensuring a comprehensive national security and only then uh, can we talk of development. So while we talk of security and development together, both go hand in hand and there is nothing sequential that either we have the economics first and the security later or vice versa. So let, let me uh, go ahead and uh, talk about this. And I assure you, especially the students, I'll keep it as simple as possible. I'm not going to use too many adjectives and adverbs uh, and ensure that the concept is clarified. Now, when you look at the new forms of warfare and in the new forms of warfare, uh, the whole idea of the powers that be in the world is a continuous contest to subjugate the weak. Now, when we talk of subjugation, it can be territorial. It can be beyond the territorial realms also. So what do, uh, let's start with the economic warfare or the economic security. It's nothing new. 
it has been in the past also and i think no other country other than india has suffered this whenever we became weak there were invasions and colonialist powers came into india that's a very big lesson if we focus too much on economics bad if we focus too much of uh, or our expenditure on the security dimension that is also bad so we need a very good balance east india company came at a time when the mughal empire was tottering there was a challenge from the south by the marathas there was a challenge from the sikhs and that is the time promptly uh, east india company turned from the commercial company to having a military and that is when we realized that economic warfare assumed a proportion of military dimension also i i want to give simple examples as to how our uh, economic might which we had for many centuries together it just dwindled i'll give you an example of my own uh, state from where i hail maharashtra and whether you all keep hearing of the farmers committing suicide i don't think people have even looked at the root cause of it that goes somewhere in the early 1900 when the british realized that what is a black cotton soil it was not meant for cotton the what was being grown in vidarbha at that particular time was jowar uh, tuwar dal some uh, red chilies and people were quite happy with whatever they they were growing and very limited amount of cash crops used to be grown the british realized that the industrial revolution back home would be fueled higher if this entire crop pattern is changed and we bring in cotton growing here and that is when the simpletons the farmers were taught that cotton can be grown and then there was another component of commercial traders who came in from rajasthan who became the middlemen they bought the cotton of these people and it was moved by train a special uh, narrow gauge railway line was established and it brought the cotton to the main gauge and then from there to bombay and off it went to manchester within a couple of years vidarbha faced drought vidarbha faced shortage of food grains because food grains had not been grown now cotton was being grown and then started this whole problem of debt servicing that is the middleman started giving loans and the poor people started getting into that trap and now there are some signs where we can see it getting out of the clutches of the middlemen now this is one very fundamental root cause where our society got weakened it's not only here it it happened even in uh, other parts of the world you look at what happened in tibet what the chinese did to them same is the case where we see wherever colonialism happened Uh, the kind of local sustenance got removed cash crops came in when the slave trade stopped and uh, slavery was abolished in uh, united states of america that their colonies can be utilized for cash crops and around 1850 to 1870 we see huge ship loads of indentured labor moving into various colonies where sugar cane was being uh, uh, grown so that is the kind of change of a particular country's economy and then getting into a debt trap which we call today as the chinese trap but the british were no less so that is exactly where uh, economic warfare can be seen the roots can be seen uh, today if it is being uh, spoken of and the kind of weakening of countries in our neighborhood whether it is sri lanka whether it is pakistan uh, possibly even myanmar maldives definitely was heading in that particular direction it is all a cyclic method where the powerful will bring the smaller countries to a debt trap and thereafter you are subjugated so that is the economic security that we have to look at very seriously 
the chinese the indian and chinese trade uh, the balance of trade is favoring the chinese and that is yet another cause of concern for the indian establishment and that is uh, what we need to balance out where our production capacity has to increase uh, we possibly are most comfortable in the service sector but service sector does not generate the kind of economic might uh, that unless we look at the remittances but remittances are again uh, subject to the turbulence that the production sector the service sector and the remittances which come from abroad uh thereafter i want to also bring out beyond the economics is also the ideological or the religious kind of security which creates turbulence very often uh the portion of history where you find uh the islamic invasions whether they were in india whether they were in europe in fact spain is an ideal example where the entire demography or the kind of uh thought process underwent a change uh, spain was actually captured and uh, it took a lot of time for them to reverse that entire process and the christians got hold of that particular area and the reverse uh, kind of movement back into christianity happened in fact spain is one country where you find in their language uh, there are a lot of words which are uh derived from arabic uh, a simple word like uh, a shirt is known as kamisa kamisa comes from the arabic kameez uh, table mesa is maze so the impact that it has on a country and for many years or for possibly many centuries uh, that thought process prevails so this kind of uh, security once weakened either ideologically or for whatever reason maybe uh, the military might was too much for spain to uh, push back but that kind of thing also happened uh, closer home near israel where you look at the kind of struggle that happened for the homeland and once they have been established there then the push back towards the neighbors happened and the kind of uh, attitude the neighbors had the moment israel became independent in the late 1940s you find that tiny nation was attacked by all its neighbors and uh, then the series continued and in fact our neighbor pakistan has the notoriety or the reputation that in those wars they sent their pilots to fly aircraft for the egyptians and even for jordan air force uh those kind of uh, activities should possibly be labeled as mercenary activities at least india has one thing to take or to boast of and very legitimately that we have never been uh, the kind of mercenaries that we see in our neighborhood uh even today where pakistan has its uh, armed forces protecting certain religious lands uh Uh, we we have never done that we have never kind of loaned our people or given our troops unless they have been under the united nations uh, flag or a bilateral agreement between us and another country so the point here is again if you try to map out the military might in the neighborhood uh, you stop at only your neighbor you got to look at the ideological affinity where Uh, the military balance could tilt because there is a backing say pakistan gets the technological backing from turkey and turkey has done wonders in uh, drone capability they have done uh, very well in uh, uh, hiving off technology from the west under the garb of being a nato member and then indigenizing that and thereafter they have been one of the biggest sellers of uh, the military or the defense products and a large amount of that made a difference in the azerbaijan uh, armenia conflict also so uh, when when you look at 
uh, your identified adversary, you should not restrict yourself only to the geographical boundaries of your adversary. You've got to uh, assess, you have to analyze and assess what more beyond that geographical boundary of your adversary. So your comprehensive uh, national security would imply uh, a possible alliance declared or undeclared. So that is exactly what we uh, need to uh, focus on. This is a point specifically for the uh, students. In the new generation, when we look at uh, the computer wars or the cyber wars, uh, the cyber superpower, so to say, a very polite word, is now being looked at the United States of America, Russia and China. These are the hegemons. When we talk of sovereignty, and that is how we started our discussion that national security implies you're being capable enough of protecting your sovereignty. Uh, if your sovereignty is restricted only to territorial claims, that's a separate issue. But you have digital sovereignty, you have cyberspace sovereignty, you have data sovereignty to protect. That is not assigned to the military. So again, we come back to the issue that every citizen is important and every person working in the governance is important. If you cannot protect your cyberspace, it implies your critical infrastructure is intruded upon. The kind of information warfare that we've seen, seen is also because of the porosity of your digital security. What is happening in Russia and Ukraine today is what you are hearing from what the West wants you to hear, which implies the cyber powers will use everything possible to give you a narrative because through cyber, they can penetrate and they can spread their narratives and in the language that you understand. So if Russia-Ukraine war is actually visible between Russia and Ukraine, but actually it is between Russia and the West. So what? where does the security or where does the reach stop? Does it stop at the geographical boundaries of Ukraine? No, not at all. It permeates into NATO. It goes beyond and crosses possibly the Atlantic Ocean also. And it starts from the United States of America. And all of them join together. And the uh, while they're footfall or boots on ground are not visible. But the penetration of the entire world and giving an information narrative and continuously giving it and doing perception shaping. A lot of people talk of perception management. Perception management is more from the defensive viewpoint. But perception shaping is where you have your intentions to shape the mind of the people who may not have access to the real picture on ground. So their cyberspace and a part of it, which is the information space, makes a lot of difference. Closer home, we have also seen that happening during the Doklam crisis. We have seen that happening during the East Ladakh crisis. That is what is popularly known as the Galwan issue. But actually, it is beyond Galwan. And uh, the entire thing, we saw what Global Times was doing. Uh, a lot of our Indian media was impacted. Maybe the nature of our democratic setup allows a lot of transparency. And it is not uh, a kind of a taboo to carry the narrative of the Chinese to our domestic audience. But here, I want to pause and ask you, if it is a whole of nation approach and if every citizen is responsible, then I think we should have the strategic culture and the strategic outlook to understand what should be blocked and what should be circulated. To simplify that, whatever comes on your WhatsApp is not necessarily true. But there is a kind of a race to be the fastest finger and to send it as far as possible because there is a kind of a status involved that you are the fastest on that. But the kind of damage it has in the entire uh, 
emotional fabric or the kind of thought process that happens when a demoralizing post is circulated uh, the damage recovery or the damage control it takes a lot of time now we look at how does it happen in many other countries while narrative spreading is also a part of the hybrid warfare in our country when you look at the cabinet committee on security we don't have the information and uh, broadcasting minister as a part of it uh, closer home in pakistan uh, the minister maybe we have still not felt the need because the ministers are capable of handling it but when we introspect what exactly is the capability of our information and broadcasting ministry to carry a narrative they can carry a narrative but who's going to structure the narrative something which i am leaving with you as a question mark and maybe in question and answer session we more on that uh, let me go uh, a step beyond that. what is the kind of uh ecological security that we talk of a lot of people say that the future war is going to be a water war it's going to be driven by uh, the kind of resource that will be short and we understand this aspect very well although we are very rich abundant in the kind of water resources that we have you look around many other countries may have one or maximum two major rivers Uh, there are countries which are not even having a major river and they are dependent on their neighbors uh, singapore is one such example where uh, they have to depend on malaysia but they have found a technological uh, solution to that that is uh, using uh, the sea water so there is a technological solution where you realize that your leverage cannot be allowed to be controlled by your neighbor who could become your adversary or is a potential adversary may not be an immediate adversary a lot of uh, arab states have uh, gone in for this technological answers but when we come to india uh, i think india is one unique country which enjoys the status of being an upper riparian state middle riparian state and a lower riparian state uh, but water flows from tibet comes through india goes into pakistan water comes from china or rather tibet and comes into india and then goes into bangladesh what exactly has china done to the mekong river and the southeast asian countries how they are dependent now on china is something for all of us to uh, give a serious thought the kind of big dams which are planned and under construction the kind of water usage which is planned by china what impact it will have on the middle and the lower riparian state is something which is extremely serious the ecological security is also important because i think environment is a global common in most of the cases whatever global commons are there for the welfare of mankind and when they start getting manipulated initially not weaponized but subsequently in the long run they get manipulated uh, manipulated and weaponized that is the time you realize that somewhere earlier in the timeline uh, people should have woken up i think that is the right time for india to wake up now what exactly does china have in mind i am telling you open source data that if you google you'll realize that china has a weather modification department it requires a lot of guts and it requires a lot of uh, strength to say that you are going to modify the weather the americans used to modify the uh, weather during the vietnam crisis but they never said openly that uh, they are modifying weather when you look at china there are two visible things firstly the weather modification department has about 37000 employees they have a large amount of uh, 
monitoring stations and modifying station in Tibet. They have large interest in the Bay of Bengal. They are studying with the help of the moored boys there, obviously in international waters. What is the cloud pattern which is happening and how it will impact on impact on colliding with the Himalayan range and how does that help or worsen the situation in the Brahmaputra Basin. So there is some interest. In addition, in the research and development field, uh, there is a project which is, when translated into English, it is called the river in the sky. The kind of research to be able to move moisture over the landmass and take it to the water stressed areas. Uh, they have been onto this project for quite some time. In comprehensive Indian national security, these two things are a kind of a red flag. How do we tackle it? Who is tasked to tackle it? Again, in the allocation of business rules, we have a Ministry of Climate Change, Environment and Forest. But he is not a part of the CCS. But he can raise, the minister and the secretary, they can raise these issues in the National Security Council and when found to be of extremely important security value, then it can be taken into the CCS. But currently, what is the thought process in this ministry is not strategic in nature. That's why I try to flag this issue. There is a lot of impact which is being felt in the South China Sea because of the artificial islands which have been constructed at a very fast pace by China. And with such impact being felt by the neighbors of China, then obviously uh, the security aspect has to be viewed regionally, collaboratively. Again, on the Pakistan front, when you look at the Indus Water Treaty. Our Prime Minister has been saying repeatedly, quite emphatically and openly, that whatever are the provisions of this water treaty uh, need to be ensured and our share of water should not be allowed to go on to the other side. When you Google, you will find two different uh, figures given. Uh, one by the Indian uh, governance mechanism and one by the Pakistan people in their assembly, national assembly. You will be surprised. The figures given by India state that less water is going while Pakistan says they are receiving more water. Then obviously some figures are a mismatch somewhere. If Pakistan figures are to be believed, then I think we need to do a lot to ensure that our share of water is utilized and dual use of such water can be made for development as well as security. And it saves a lot of expenditure on security because you have then these canals which flow down and can come down right up to Rajasthan. And that is where more area can then be irrigated as well as more water can be used for uh, urban areas as well. And the kind of stress that we find between states on water sharing can be removed. But then this can only happen if we assign a value to water resource from the security viewpoint as well. Let me come to agriculture security and food security. I am talking about them differently. When I am talking of food security, I want to narrate an example. Uh, in 1965, uh, maybe because in 1962 we had lost very badly militarily to China and uh, Pakistan became quite adventurous, especially the military rulers in power. And they thought this is the time to uh, get even with India. And uh, they went in for some adventurism in the area of Kutch. Uh, we did not have an adequate response, but subsequently we went in for a response in uh, JNK and in Punjab. And that is the time when uh, United States had a different view about us and they had a different view about Pakistan and they immediately realized that uh, they could leverage power on India and they said that uh, 
any kind of food supplies food grains to india uh, would not be allowed so they tightened that and uh, this is not something new you can see that same response or same kind of behavior of these superpowers whenever a country is in a crisis uh, they can aggravate that and food is something that you really need that is the time i was in delhi my father was posted in delhi and i remember distinctly hearing a wonderful speech from the prime minister lal bahadur shastri and i as a uh, i think i was in class 2 or 3 but we were uh, glued to the uh, radio that we had at home and the prime minister very nicely strongly boldly stated that we are going through a food crisis and as a prime minister he would eat one meal a day in the week and he urged the people to observe fast on one day of a week the entire nation went in that direction and we did not have to yield to the demands of united states if we come to that state any country can exercise leverage over us and how does that situation come let us leave behind what inheritance we had from the british but let us look at what is happening today if there is a continuous weather change and as predicted if the ambient temperature is going to go up by 5 degrees what is going to happen to our crops what is going to happen to the output that we will have if excess use of fertilizers is done what will be the productivity of our soil you may have a military victory but you will have to yield space if a leverage can be exercised on you in food grains and we have seen the kind of uh, turbulence that gets caused every time there is a food shortage of a particular item we have seen governments under stress on issues like onion prices tomato prices now you are talking of lemon prices so that is the kind of uh, attitude we have nationally and the government in power comes under tremendous pressure you don't wake up for the weather part you will have a problem in the food part let's come to the agriculture part when i said i am looking at them differently because while food has immediate sustenance issues but agriculture is related to the economy let's leave aside the food products but then there are definitely a large number of non food products which impact your economy and if we are going to be stressed because our economy goes down then your gdp goes down and then perforce you are looking left and right for economic help and that is again when you feel the person behind who was till then your supporter suddenly exercises a leverage over you pakistan has faced similar issues pakistan up to a particular stage was growing cotton to a large extent now suddenly they find uh, that the cotton growing areas are under water stress if indus water treaty is properly implemented in india's favor legitimately pakistan will face this cotton crop stress much more when afghanistan had not been taken over by taliban and there was a particular dam dam which was to be constructed over kabul river uh, the impact would have been positive for afghanistan because kabul would have got more drinking water but the water in kabul river would have reduced and at attack where kabul river and indus river meet the confluence is there that is the area where a lot of cotton is grown so that would have faced impact i think now uh, that part is possibly not a worry as much for uh, pakistan as it was earlier when you look at ecology and you look at the growing interest of countries in the polar region ambassador verma is here he knows the best when you talk of how arctic is being looked at the polar regions are being looked at 
Russia is actually the giant when you look at the interest in Arctic. United States has a presence, but not as strong as Russia. China is increasingly looking at the Arctic Circle to seek a polar route, develop its capability to have icebreakers, and seek a route to the west, which is going to be the shortest, in addition to the minerals that it is going to find there. Such a change in China's infrastructure is, is also going to impact on its Malacca dilemma. So that is something where you have to connect the dots. When will it happen? Not immediately, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow, but soon. So when you again look at comprehensive national security, this one leverage in the maritime zone, which you could have exercised, is going to be a little weakened. Let me move to space, which is a new domain in warfare. In, in, in case of uh, many countries, they have already identified cyber, space, information as domains of warfare. So space security or the assets of your own assets in space, as well as knowing very clearly what are the assets of your adversaries in space, which you need to monitor. What are the capabilities of your adversary in space to be able to monitor your area as also to man monitor your assets and possibly damage them is also something which has to be seen seriously. Normally in our uh, geostrategic environment, we have not been giving so much of importance to space as a domain. Most of the countries which are proceeding very fast in blocking slots in the space domain, uh, within the next about two to five years, you will see the uh, space dominance or space supremacy by these countries. India has been generally conservative and adopting the path as charted out and as uh, enabled by ISRO. But in the last about year and a half or say, uh, specifically, uh, when Prime Minister Modi in October 21 went public and said that ISRO would be more into R&D and into government plans, but the entire space sector for the country will be available in the private domain also. We just about six months or so uh, beyond what declaration had been done, uh, a couple of associations have come up where they are looking at capacity enhancement, giving empowerment to the private sector, to the citizens, by having more assets in space. When you look at space, there are fundamentally about four parts of it, maybe more also. But essentially, any country which has the launch capability, uh, you'll be able to have more number of satellites of your own, as well as you can commercialize that and have other countries launching satellites through you. Uh, we are quite good at it. ISRO is quite good at it. But uh, in the race, we need to speed up more. We possibly have a capability of having seven launches in a year. You look at Elon Musk. He's having a launch every week. Uh, we have capability to launch a particular uh, weight, uh, the satellites of a particular weight. Russia, America, France, they have capability of a higher weight profile. But if we have a capability to launch a number of nano and micro satellites, instead of a 300 kg satellite, you have about anything below 10 or anything between 10 to 15 kg satellite, which means you will be able to have more number of satellites. You manage the energy part well, the power part well, then the number of years uh, whatever you need, uh, you can have in an optimum manner. I'm saying optimum. I did not say maximum because so far we've been going for the maximum part. So our satellite, although planned for five years, have been lasting for about 10 years or 10 years plus also. But there is a danger there and that impacts the space security. Uh, after a cycle or a timeline of every three years, the technology changes so fast that if you have a satellite 
for 10 years or more uh, you are out of the uh, technology loop and your uh, your satellites become that much more vulnerable i think that time now is for miniaturizing having more number of them in uh, what is akin to a swarm of drones here closer in space but there we talk of constellations or convoys and there when we talk of convoys and constellations we also look at different types of orbits uh, the easiest to handle and that is what uh, we possibly have been doing well is the polar orbit where a satellite comes from north to south we are quite well off because our adversaries are to the west or to the north so we get a fairly good idea of that uh, similarly our country is quite elongated in shape so for the development part also uh, satellite moving from north to south gives the entire landmass a very good coverage but that's not everything i think we need a combination of polar and inclined orbits and that has an immediate impact on the very time at which the satellites arrive over your space so that that is slightly uh, a little bit uh, difficult than handling polar orbits but uh, nothing comes easy and nothing comes cheap and we need to go more into this uh, the second thing which is a component beyond the launch part is the issue of the satellite being positioned into orbit uh, we are quite good at it but we have to improve further in this and the kind of satellites that have to be there they have to cater for the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance for the positioning navigation timing the communication aspect so there are multiple uses and multiple uses which cross between the civil and the military domain so there we have to uh, get good at having more number of satellites as well as having varied and multiple payloads now payloads is something where i think we should have done well but there is a lot of scope because if we are good at software we should be very good at shaping our payloads also Uh, this is one challenge which the younger generation needs to look at and the payload uh, designing and the payload matching with the kind of miniaturizing of the platform has to be done and has to be done very fast combining the payloads on the same platform is also essential when we look at a particular platform carrying only one payload and which is a fair weather payload for uh, looking at the uh, ground the soil the forest the agriculture there we again uh, go wrong because when there is a cloud cover uh, that pass has gone waste the world has already come to combining combining two kinds of payload on the same platform i think that's where uh, we need to go in the uh, race for having your own uh what is possibly going to be equivalent of bidu that is something which we have to design we did launch uh, seven satellites for irnss uh, but there is a lot that needs to be done there and if and when we achieve that the entire regional capability will grow uh, we would like our maritime our land our continental requirements and our regional presence also Uh, to uh, get better otherwise today people are either uh, reliant on or dependent on gps we are dependent on glonass or we are dependent on bedu so we we definitely need to do better here so that is the payload part that i wanted to explain payload again uh, each particular requirement or stakeholder has his own requirement uh within the services itself there are differences while the army would require a higher resolution with a narrow swath the air force would require a greater resolution and greater swath also navy requires a greater swath and they can compromise on the resolution part so again this is something which we have to design well uh, we have to learn from other superpowers into this whether it is usa france russia 
even israel has done well in this field and uh, even their launch is quite customized so that is something that uh, we need to do better uh, the kind of utilization of this space these space assets has been very well utilized by a number of our other ministries also and that is where the cross linkages between security and development come up uh, the ministry of road and transport has made use of this well uh, the ministry of railways has been using it well uh, there is a requirement of uh, the ministry of climate change and environment to use it better a lot of states have used it quite well in fact arunachal pradesh has uh, been using it extremely well telangana has been using it very well uh, so when we look at uh, the kind of data that resides unfortunately the kind of networking of this is a little poor and that is where we need to improve so when i uh, mentioned of the three components which i have already said and the fourth component is the ground component in which it is the ground station where the reception happens and also the networking because we need to fuse information and use it and that is exactly what i am coming to this is data and your data is always threatened by the cyber intrusions your data security data sovereignty is as important as your physical security which ministry has to do it so far we were looking at multiple ministries doing their own creating their own islands of excellence and then guarding themselves Uh, in the last about year and a half uh, the cyber security national cyber security coordinator in uh, nscs has energized to a large extent the appointment was there even earlier mr gulshan rai was there now general pant is there and a lot of sensitization and a lot of synergy between ntro between nscs and the users to ensure that the critical infrastructure is protected so that your data is secure if your data is lost your sovereignty is lost i think that is a lesson which i am driving home particularly today and i am trying to say that the future is in space the data from space is to be saved and this is one aspect which is extremely important let me come and look at uh, the energy security uh, energy security if i had spoken about it about 6 months back people wouldn't have given it due importance but the moment now i am talking of energy security and drawing your attention to ukraine russia conflict see what exactly has happened in nato uh, the kind of call taken by nato members because of their dependence on energy uh, source of energy from russia uh, the kind of weakness in nato is visible even usa for that matter is looking at it differently now because they realize that energy requirements for europe cannot be replaced by them and the countries which are the users in europe members of nato have a different voice now russia being put under sanctions has no meaning as long as europeans who fear war are paying for their energy requirements to russia what option does united states have will it relax the sanctions on iran or venezuela then where does it stand in the global world order in the world order what happens to its credibility so this is something which again is important for us to understand so what is the lesson for india renewable sources of energy alternate source of energy that is again a citizens responsibility as much as it is of the government we started possibly we started a bit too late but that is something where we have to look at from the whole of nation approach the government has done quite a bit in this and there is much more to be done but i think where we can conserve usage of petroleum Uh, we will be able to ensure that our strategic autonomy in terms of not becoming slave to energy suppliers we will have a different position so that energy security part we have to look at differently now and we have to act what is the issue about 
the biosecurity, biosafety. Again, if I had spoken about this in say 2015 or 2018, people won't have taken me seriously. But when I look at post COVID or during COVID, this has a lot of importance. So if I were to talk about this slightly in a broader perspective, I would say CBRN security. In our troubled neighborhood, the kind of people who may be unreasonable and when you have a troubled neighbor where the nuclear button could be with somebody else and that somebody else is not a person who can give you comfort. So then obviously in the long run and by now we could have looked at more seriously to be able to develop a secure system of at least protection in the nuclear domain. Getting on to the chemical and the biological domain, we've had accidents. It's not that India has not seen chemical accidents. Union carbide example, maybe the students may not have been present when such a thing happened or may have been very young to realize. But that's a disaster in the waiting. Okay, such things will happen. Then what do we do? At least our youth should know that if you are the first observer, then obviously you must know what to do. Currently, what is our response mechanism? If I smell something or I see something dangerous, I immediately ring up 100 or whatever number is of the local police. Are our local police capable of handling such a thing? They are the first responders. Maybe there is a requirement of going deeper and spread faster towards the response mechanism and not develop, not depend totally on the NDMA. NDMA will go to restore the situation, but the first responder is not the NDMA. The first responder is the police station in that particular area. So again, in this security issue, we need to look at it seriously and have education or awareness or orientation mechanisms where the future generation looks at it differently. The human resource security. We have been uh, very often talking about we have a youth population, we have a youth bulge, we have very young population and that population is going to uh, give us that edge over the other countries. Definitely I agree with that. Uh, you see a large number of nations which have a negative growth. We have a kind of growth which enables us to ensure that human resources are adequate in number. Can we go beyond the adequacy part and look at the caliber part of it? Is the education system good enough? Is the skilling system good enough? What are the reasons why the industries when they are moving from one country to another, would rather prefer to go to Vietnam rather than India, but they will come to India at a later stage. By that, that industry's value may have gone down. The consumer base would have reduced. So if you have to utilize an opportunity, then the human resource security in terms of adequacy and in terms of caliber and quality has to be uh, really looked at much differently than what we are doing. Uh, many nations which face the challenge of adequacy have ensured that the quality is good and have gone in for a technological revolution where the adequacy part is overcome. You look at China also. In, in China, when they looked at reducing the numbers in the People's Liberation Army, PLA, they went in first for mechanization. Thereafter, they've gone in for informatization and then they are going in for intelligentization. So what does it mean? You have a problem, you have identified a problem, then you have to overcome that. The problem has to be resolved. In our case, we do identify a problem, but the mechanism to resolve that problem will have to be much better and much faster than uh, what we are looking at. Uh, there is a kind of in industrial and technological security also. I'm, I'm trying to split that from uh, the economic security. Uh, why did the prime minister have to come up and say Atmanirbhar Bharat? He had to say that because he realized that the technological uh, sovereignty was not there. 
the technological dependence on a number of nations was increasing if not increasing it was not reducing that is one of the reason that the inventory of our armed forces is dependent on one particular country in uh, to a large extent uh, that's where the impact would be felt on many decisions so the industrial and the technological capability has to go up and go faster when you're going in for atmanirbhar bharat there will be a gap uh, there will be a time gap uh, you may not have everything possible so the art of managing this change is to ensure that you don't create hollowness at the same time you don't repeat the same thing that we can't do it so we will go abroad so that that i think management of this change has to be done uh, quite well uh, i want to uh, specifically come to uh, the information part which i had touched upon earlier and that is where i feel that the youth of the country are extremely good at handling digital devices and there is no formal training required there is no education they can handle digital devices even if they are from an uneducated background or less educated background or even from a, a poor background uh, even in the indian army i i've seen or in the armed forces i've seen uh, when the smartphones came i don't think we ever conducted training for anyone they they just from the peer group they learned and they became very good and that is the weakness that has been identified by our adversaries and because they are good at handling this so the proliferation of negativity goes through in the information domain and uh, that is something which uh, can be worked upon simplistically uh, by even rru because these solutions for defense are extremely important you can go in for an offense provided you are particularly clear that your defense mechanism is uh, really good uh, most of the points which i have covered i have deliberately gone on to the non military domain uh, the military domain i am not particularly touching because i think uh, there uh, quite a few classified issues are there and uh, we uh, possibly could look at it uh, during the question and answer session and uh, whatever i can answer i can do that and uh, one more point before i uh, close this is about the infrastructure security uh, the planning of infrastructure has to be in keeping with the kind of threats that unfold uh, whenever the situation is bad whether these are bridges whether these are roads whether these are airports uh, whatever you call it whatever comes under infrastructure you have to really look at that part hospitals also are can be considered in this and that infrastructure is also extremely important uh, diversification of transportation systems by the government including the waterways which are now coming up are very important especially when uh, you are in crisis you look at again uh, russia ukraine war uh, the kind of bridges which have been taken away the kind of buildings which have been demolished Uh, the airports which have been demolished so infrastructure security has to be uh, taken care of whether from internal threats as well as from the external threats uh, internal threats uh, terrorism uh, we've seen it for over half a century uh, we have a system which has matured to a large extent terrorism is something which comes from across the borders we cannot change our neighbors we cannot change our neighborhood but again here uh, there are countries from where we can borrow lessons we can in fact educate a number of countries because we have learned the hard way uh, we have had entire turbulence for a uh, very severe 20 years but now things are getting better but the lessons which we have learned from counter terrorism should not be lost uh i think i will end my talk here and uh, i am ready to take questions or even comments for that matter jai hind thank you so much sir i think uh, over the last uh, hour that you have spoken uh, and that hour has passed by without uh, really noticing i uh, was jotting down a lot of notes because i think uh, the the two words that come straight away to my mind one of course is the broad sweep that you have actually 
touched upon across so many domains i mean i just noted down at least 10 or 11 domains that you have touched upon and the fact that in each of this you have uh, i think uh, provoked thought um and and of course there are many other issues on which you have, maybe we could touch upon during the interaction i'm not going to uh, take too much time i think we uh, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm in asking questions i can see a few already in the chat box and i know that we have an extremely um, educated audience here i would begin first i think with, um, by by uh, requesting mr kishore babu who's been raising his hand for quite some time sir you may like to ask a question before i come to the chat box my request is if you could just introduce yourself and keep it brief so that jal khandari knows who is who is uh, responding to uh, kishore sir your uh, i think your audio is on mute you may have to unmute Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. It's honored to be a part of this meeting. I am editor World Focus. We are a magazine on international relations. Been around for quite some time now. Sir, you were talking about perception shaping. In that, you talk of to structure the narrative. Sir, a little bit, if you can tell me about structuring the narrative. Okay. Uh, Uh, I'll be very sir. After this, I'll ask you one more. Okay, I'll be very candid. Uh, the narrative uh, that has to be carried is a part of the overall strategic plan. Uh, a narrative cannot be independent of a strategic plan. Uh, say, for example, the strategic plan is conflict avoidance. Then the narrative has to be based on that. If the narrative is to go in for a conflict, a kinetic conflict. then the narrative again should be uh, as per that if there is a end goal in sight and you are looking at conflict resolution uh, then the narratives have to shape the perception in a manner that at the end of the conflict what has been achieved so when we say uh, who is to shape this narrative uh, the diplomatic narrative or when we look at how does the government do it uh, in the cc as you are aware all of you are aware uh, who sits this is the absolute high table and there they know exactly what would suit the country and that is the kind of narrative that has to come out uh, in democratic countries and in autocratic countries uh, there is a huge difference in an autocratic country uh, or the shapes of uh, a particular country how they function uh, there is one narrative which comes and it gets proliferated all across the job thereafter is not to modify the content but there after it is only to propagate it as much as you can in our case uh, the moment a narrative comes there are 10 counter narratives which spring up from civil society which is actually a strength of the democratic setup that we chose for ourselves in our constitution when we said that we want to be a democracy so we are proud to be a democracy and we are not even at uh, or even 1% saying that uh, the perception shaping should be such that no other narrative should come but whatever narrative is to be propagated has to be thought through and the means of carrying it have to be thought through what has to come as a counter immediately we should know how to get past it and then there has to be a continuous monitoring as to what is the impact that is being felt now traditionally we may have had a particular structure to do it currently the younger generation they are masters in social media they are very good in uh, digital presence and they are very good at monitoring various uh, bodies or various surveys which happen the only thing here is extremely important is what is the credibility of these surveys and what is the agenda of these narratives and surveys so there is no fixed answer that the government would have for it but like i began by saying that a national good or a national goal will be carried well if it is a whole of nation approach and if the citizens are convinced based on what they think is right for the nation 
what is good for the national power that they should be able to propagate proliferate or contain it basically when you look at a citizen there are only three things which a citizen has to do he feels as per his own thought process that this is a very bad kind of a message which has come from across or which has been generated from within he just has to dump it he doesn't have to send it to everyone look how bad the message is because you are actually helping the cause of the person who has proliferated it the second one is if it is very good you don't have to ask anybody you have to just move it fast and the third one is where you have a doubt so obviously there is a peer group there are your seniors in a place where you are uh, there are more enlightened people even if they may be younger to you so you got to depend on them and you got to do that if a nation develops this strategic culture especially in democratic countries the problem will be reduced but currently there is no method by which such awakening or such orientation has been done and i think it is more important for the citizens and the conscience keepers to work on this uh kandare sir sorry kishore sir i'll just uh, step in because i wanted to ask something which is relevant to what you said sir about the need for the strategic plan and for the narrative to go hand in hand in this context if you could just touch upon the importance of public communication and um, you know how could it be more effective is it already so in the indian context just your thoughts uh, dr venkat you want me to answer this <laughs> sir i leave it to you no no i'll answer this i'll give you an example also see the choice is uh, with the nation uh, whether you want to give a narrative or not give a narrative at all even that is a choice uh you you take your mind back to doklam people said there was no response that's also a decision so when you don't respond at all to somebody and that person keeps hammering at you and you are just not responding at least not in the information domain but when it comes to a particular place where you definitely feel there has to be a response at the right time in the right quarter then you do it uh you were in the nscs when you saw uh, what kind of deficiencies were there in the strategic communication setup that we had and then the nscs stepped in and then they started doing whatever they are doing now and the strategic communication started happening there is much more to do that's what i am trying to say there is much more to do. Yeah, Kishore ji, please ask your second yeah. question, and then we will go to Ambassador Varma. Sir, you were talking about water security. The government of India, under Modi ji's government, has recognized a new category of water, that is air water. So technically, the atmosphere they take it out from the atmosphere. The atmosphere has about six times more water than all the rivers put together. The government of India has done a lot to see that happens. The navy is using some of those missions. where all that you need is thing and it produces good quality water and it is something that takes care of water security of even of the island nations around us who have asked for that type of mission so that they are they do not have to go for desalination and in other areas where we have got a lot of uh, problem in the ground water which has got fluorine and ars arsenic and means the children this air water which the government has cleared as a new category which is recognized by is and others is doing a lot of good works talking about water security that's all nothing else no you are absolutely right uh, uh, water security this air water is something which is being uh, looked at very seriously by a lot of people and uh, i have used it and i can tell you it is one of the best forms of water that you can ever get and uh, this also opens up uh, the manufacturing sector because the kind of requirement that we will have is massive Yes. and uh, uh, especially in the big dams uh, when you look at the dams which have been constructed for the or over the himalayan rivers the biggest problem in these uh, rivers is the silting the rapid pace of silting most of the dams uh, you'll find that whatever was the planned capacity and the current capacity there is a huge gap and the silting or the desilting for them 
again involves a uh, recurrent cost so uh, obviously i think we are learning from experience and uh, what mr kishore said i agree fully that this is another way forward thank you sir thanks sir thanks sir oh, thank you kishore ji ambassador verma has been waiting patiently ambassador verma please and then i'll come to abhinav yeah no, first of all to thank uh, general bandare for an excellent presentation uh, you know there's so much i learned uh, today and uh, our young colleagues who have uh, joined us on this also both uh, they have found this uh, presentation absolutely brilliant uh, two points i want to make uh, just to leave some, two thoughts you see in the old system of security when security was defined in more traditional ways there is a very clear understanding on who will deal with those security threats traditional security threats are threats that states have faced faced for several decades and uh, it's very clear who deals with them. in our case there is a very clear civil military distribution of responsibilities and uh, it has worked very well i have no issue there and that is not what i'm saying when you define security in a comprehensive way and uh, general bandare has explained it very beautifully very nicely the various facets of comprehensive security and it is it is very right you know there is no problem with it. the issue arises when you define it in such a broad comprehensive way who's responsible for taking it forward who's responsible for addressing this problem and this is not a problem just for india it is a problem that countries are facing all over the world and each country addresses it according to its own uh, systems traditions constitutional procedures uh, closed systems autocracies democracies you can have a i mean each does it in their own way in india i think we have made a beginning uh, in the last say about 5 10 years i would say not more than that in trying to understand the complexity of comprehensive security but my suspicion is that we are only at the beginning of this process if it's a 10 feet ladder we are at probably 2 feet or 2 and a half feet long way to go secondly in the traditional security issues it is very clear that the central government has all the responsibility and all the power there is you know it, it is very clear there is no dispute on it but when you go to comprehensive security when you deal with water when you deal with climate when you deal with agriculture food production the thing becomes very blurred very blurred and a lot of the thing comes to the issue of states also taking responsibility for mm. and states when you run into states we have a federal distribution of power and and states you know deal with everyday issues and they always believe that bigger issues long term issues center will take care and the states need not do anything so that there is a bigger problem so who does what in comprehensive security is a fundamental problem the second point i want to make is that our security elite i mean i i'm not taking names i say everyone included is going through a very big learning process and this last uh, ukraine russia war ukraine uh, russia west war uh, completely agree with kemi bandare it is a russia west war i think this the what lessons we have learned in the last 3 months we have not learned it in the last 30 years i can tell you that because our security elite was a subset of the economic elite in the country and they had this fanciful group comforting uh, ideas about the benign nature of globalization benign nature that if you open up your markets you go abroad you put your money abroad you get technology abroad you have free trade agreements uh, you know you cooperate everything will be good everything is for the good i mean russia is learning i mean its own lessons uh, they are responsible for their lessons they are learning but lessons are there for everyone to see nothing is free in this world 
everything can be weaponized and everything is being weaponized. So I think the security elite should finally tell our economic elite in our country, please let us learn the lessons with an open mind. And there's one lesson that I would particularly mention in the presence of our defense officer. And this is something that the different forces have been, at least in my view, uh, a little short of good analysis. This whole notion of interoperability. And, uh, you know, while I was in service, I used to raise this question. I've been raising this question. I, my personal belief, is, you know, I may be wrong, that most people don't understand what interoperability is. And if they do, they are not able to explain how it is in India's security interests. Because if we have learned that what you buy, you cannot control, ownership is not controlled. If you buy a technology from abroad which has interoperability features, what is the guarantee that your supplier will not off the switch or change the... So this, uh, I'm very glad that General Bandare mentioned Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Completely supported, 100% support. Prime Minister's view is something that is a, it's, it's a very difficult process, but it is the only process that will ensure the long-term well-being of India. But Atma Nirbhar Bharat also applies to our uh, defense forces. So how do you combine this notion of interoperability, fighting other people's wars? I think there is a fundamental problem. And I, you know, I don't say it as criticism. I am only saying it that given the lessons that we are learning, we have to rethink, think very clearly. Uh, but I think uh, that is also useful for the discussion. So, but let, but let me compliment Dr. Venkat. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, uh, General Bandare, a great pleasure to, to hear you today. I, you know, I hope we'll be in touch and uh, we'll take this conversation forward elsewhere as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for those. Uh, General Kandare, would you want to say anything in that context or should I move on, sir? Um, all the points which Ambassador Verma has brought out is absolutely right. And uh, the uh, specifics like uh, the lessons learned in the last three months uh, from the conflict, the West War, is absolutely right. And uh, another thing I just, uh, I'll just supplement here and Ambassador Verma is fully aware. Uh, the Russian military went through a process of transformation. And uh, I have been observing it very closely and I saw the Chinese were in a way uh, a, quite a bit substantial part of what uh, were the goals of Russian military transformation they were adopting. Uh, well, technologically they were adopting what the West was doing, but uh, organizationally, doctrinally, uh, whatever Russia was doing, they were looking at it. So to my mind, uh, most observant of this present clash is China because they, they are seeing what is going wrong and what can go wrong and the kind of fight that uh, Ukraine backed by the West is putting up obviously it brings out uh, your transformed military for the first time in real terms so uh, this is one more angle that we have to be looking at our uh, defense forces and unless we study the Russian military transformation, how can we study the Chinese military transformation? So I, I think that is where I have been trying to push people within the defense forces to focus on to this aspect. Thank you, sir. Very insightful. Uh, Abhinav, would you like to ask a question, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Jain, sir, this is Major Abhinav Gupta, sir. I am undergoing Chinese language course at uh, RRU. Uh, sir, my question with you, sir, is that uh, in recent times we have seen a a lot of increase in the conflict, especially with the PLA, both in our north, uh, northern borders and our eastern borders, sir. But uh, till now, sir, as a local military commander, we have seen that uh, there still does not exist a clear-cut military policy with respect to the uh, with respect to the sir the force level that can be applied at the tactical level, vis-a-vis -vis any conflict with the PLA. Sir, my question to you is 
is it something that stems from the lack of clarity lack of tactical clarity that is available at the strategic think tank level or is it something that uh, we could see as a failure of our military leadership to uh, bring about the ground reality in front of the government okay abhinav uh, interesting question uh, since you are a practitioner obviously you wanted to ask a question that you face on a daily basis uh remember that the present uh, military leadership the entire hierarchy has faced similar challenges uh memories are actually short but let me tell you uh we are from a generation we have seen such conflicts if you remember what happened in sundrongchu uh i i will uh, refresh your memory maybe quite a few may not even know the first time the chinese entered the doklam plateau with a proper patrol of 100 odd people i was a second lieutenant then so it's right. not that the present uh, generation is facing this conflict we've been facing them we've been handling them uh, what when you look at yourself you look at the chinese also uh, the chinese at that point in time were facing or were being shepherded by their leadership as to hide and bite till you arrive so they were not making a big issue out of it now is the time when their leadership feels that they have arrived and this is the time when they want to test what is they want to test the capability of what capability have and what is our intent whenever we are uh, faced with this situation it is their own analysis and their assessment as to which is the weak spot along the northern border and what is the weakness in the hierarchy uh, a tactical response has strategic ramifications so many a time when you get a, a kind of a, a message to say no not here here we are not going to respond in strength there is a reason for it there is a reason that is known best to the army commander it is known uh, to the uh, army chief to the mo directorate Uh, let me tell you abhinav there is something known as a china study group i am sure you would have heard of it the china study group is the absolute apex level which deals with each and every incident that happens along the northern borders even if somebody would have sneezed there the china study group would have taken note of it and the china study group is the mea thing which uh, the the kind of uh, meeting that happens in the mo directorate the ministers are there the secretaries are there the nsa is there the chiefs are there uh, people from the intelligence community are there uh, what you are seeing is what is visible to you what the china study group is seeing is what is beyond the hill what is behind the curtain what is under the carpet what can that particular incident lead to and is it worth getting into it in the larger interest of the nation is what is being seen there it's not a failure of anybody the point is you are doing your job well compliments for that your seniors are doing a job well compliments for that but these are national decisions there are certain uh, specified things as per sop which have to be done which are done now when the next step is taken by the chinese again there is an sop which you respond to but in case you are told to deviate from the sop then there is obviously a bigger plan which is being which is unfolded so that's my short answer to it if you want more specifics i will tell you later separately thank you sir thank you so much sir i think that was wonderful i uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat box but i also wanted to mention to general khandari uh, is that we've got uh, among our audience uh, a visiting faculty here uh, professor shen minshe who's uh, here with us for the last uh, i mean he's here uh, since the last week Uh, of um, april and is here for a month uh, professor shen has been focusing a lot on the chinese military himself comes from a military background and i was just wondering that uh, with this conversation that just took place if professor shen would like to just step in and and, and give his observations or his inputs then uh, i think it will just elevate the discussion sir uh, professor shen if you are able to hear me would you like to comment or make an observation or ask a question whatever is comfortable Uh, okay uh since uh, general uh, uh, to give an uh, uh, overview uh, 
about uh, India comprehensive uh, national security. Uh, I have one comment and one question. Uh, in, in Taiwan, because uh, we already have a CIP, a critical infrastructure protection, and even we already have a protection plan. Uh, in Taiwan, we have a ed element about the critical infrastructure. Uh, we have water, medical, energy, science park, and government, ICT, and traffic and bank and financial. So we already are prepared any uh, uh, emergency event uh, about this uh, uh, critical infrastructure. Because you know that uh, China, um, they already prepared how to use a grid zone operation uh, to destroy our social order or make our uh, operation is not, uh, it become uh, confused uh, or in chaos. So uh, I think this could be a reference to India to make a critical infrastructure protection plan. And my question is, uh, uh, we can see that uh, Russia in the uh, Russia-Ukraine war right now, uh, today is uh, seven, uh, maybe in nine, May, may have a military parade, I don't know, in Mariupol or in Moscow, but I think that uh, Russia will go decline after this war. And uh, uh, American uh, uh, Blinken also said that China will become American's main adversary. And how India uh, uh, prepare if China become American main adversary, how India uh, to prepare or to how to deal with this uh, situation that that uh, uh, in development in the regional security. Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chen, firstly, thank you for your comment. And uh, I agree with you, every nation which has to uh, fight a war for itself uh, has to do it for itself. It can't be uh, doing it based on somebody else assuring uh, how or telling you how to fight your own war. So we all have to fight our own wars and our critical infrastructures are our responsibility to protect and we also have plans. Uh, in fact, we are refining those plans and uh, we have segregated those plans, those which are dependent on cyber, uh, that is IT enabled and those which are not dependent on that. And we have those from the physical security to digital security, those plans are there. And uh, it's not only uh, at the level of protection, but it is even if it uh, goes bad, then how do you do uh, relief and rehabilitation? So that is something. But what you said is absolutely right. Uh, I take your point that every nation needs to have this kind of a planning. Uh, the second issue is uh, more geopolitical about uh, Russia, uh, USA, China, and India kind of an equation. Uh, USA is trying to say now that uh, China is going to be the main adversary. Uh, we've been telling the United States of America for many years that China is going to be our main adversary. And uh, it's, it's not a kind of a revelation to us. We have been telling, uh, I have personally had my own interactions with a large number of my counterparts in which we have been telling them uh, in closed door meetings, even in open uh, meetings, we've been telling them that uh, somewhere we feel that the Americans uh, need to look more beyond uh, the Russia centric approach and they need to evaluate whether what Kissinger and Nixon had done, whether that was the right thing to create China to such a level where they have started questioning and uh, challenging the United States. As far as we are concerned, at no stage have we been dependent on United States of America for our own war or for our own defense. We have always told Americans that we will fight our own war with China. We are not actually even looking at a kind of a military collaboration with the United States to defend our northern borders. Uh, you've seen for the kind of standoff duration that we've had. We've done our own bit and we shall continue to do that. Yes, wherever it comes to collaboration, we are not averse to collaboration, 
but we understand our responsibility that we have very clearly two identified adversaries which we have acknowledged long term back china and pakistan are our two identified adversaries for which you heard our previous cds saying that we face a two front war and that's exactly the challenge for which we are prepared so we when you asked me that how do we prepare for it we've been preparing for it and how do we face it that's our issue uh, such issues will not be uh, dealt with openly but should there be a requirement we will discuss separately thank you so much sir i think there have been a few questions in the chat box which i think i'll take maybe uh, a number of questions actually dr haider who's actually in right now in uh, kabul afghanistan uh, i think this is uh, uh, his question flows from one of your earlier comments uh, general nare uh, which is on uh, the security and development going hand in hand so he says how do we find that balance um especially considering that the situation is so dynamic so i think uh, he's 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 trying to understand the dilemma in terms of finding that balance uh, at all times i think that is one question there is another question uh, on uh, if russia goes to decline after this war with ukraine and china becomes other uh, this was the question that dr shen asked i'm sorry i think he's already addressed this Arjun Dikshit asked this question again on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, he says, "What would be the appropriate theories for understanding or making sense of demilitarization?" I think that's his question. What would be the appropriate theories for understanding or making sense of demilitarization? Uh, shall I? One more question. Shall I ask General Kandare? Or? Yes, please. Three yeah. questions I can handle. Yeah. uh this i think there's one more question which says at what point does propaganda become information warfare and what criteria should we use when evaluating the severity of propaganda okay uh dr heather uh, your point about uh, how do you balance between security and development is a very Uh, a decision which has to be taken based on a lot of experience and also based on accurate analysis and assessments of a, of your future threats if uh, your future threats are uh, going to be more kinetic and you need more kinetic capability or even non kinetic capability for which you need money then perforce you have to spur up your economic uh, machine now this is something which uh, cannot be uh, discussed in a laboratory kind of an environment uh, a lot of it comes from the studies of the past conflicts uh, a kind of study of your adversaries whether internal or external uh, how have we been doing it uh, there have always been clamors for increasing the defense budget going beyond 1.5% of the uh, gdp uh, people want 3% of it to happen uh, in real terms how does it matter so when you look at our prime minister when he says that i want a 5 trillion economy and he said that uh, when uh, we were at about 2.5 trillion economy and uh, what does it imply actually the moment he says let me go to 5 trillion economy actually it is uh, in real terms about 3% of the gdp what you are spending now which means you will get double the amount of money so people in uniform will have to understand that unless the economy grows your allocations cannot grow at the same pace at which you demand but if you also contribute towards uh, economic growth now how does that happen in indian context i can explain in afghanistan context i may not be able to give the best example but i leave it to you to apply when the prime minister mentioned that we want a 5 trillion economy he also mentioned that the defense production sector private and public must go to a 5 billion export target now the moment you go to a 5 billion export target means you've contributed to the increase in the national economy which will spur economy as well as the security allocations so that is the reason why i have tried to take this topic in fact dr venkat had specifically asked me Uh, the rationale for talking about comprehensive national uh, security because your 
comprehensive national security brings out a parallel process for comprehensive economic development and if you can ensure a secure environment development takes much faster foreign aid comes to you much faster investments come to you much faster so even if allocation has not been made but indirectly a secure environment reduces the insurance costs so your trade gets better the, there are people who want to trade with you so both go hand in hand and there is no clear cut uh, say equation or formula which you can uh, use to uh, give this out but like in india we have niti aayog we have which uh, talks about futuristic economic growth we have the national security council secretary which talks of the comprehensive national security in addition to what the ministries do the ministries primarily are tasked to execute it but these two bodies ensure that the interministerial gaps get plugged by doing that the uh, growth improves the security improves so there are various ways of achieving this so uh, i i will not have any other uh, thing to say on this uh, coming to uh, the demilitarization process uh, let me bring out one issue uh, you look at any united peacekeeping operations and you'll realize what is the sequence that is adopted there uh, the first of all uh, both the sides have to agree to cessation of hostilities and that is where the first step always and and i am talking with personal experience because i was with the united peacekeeping operations as a major in central america uh, which was which is the backyard of united states of america and they were very worried as to what is happening in these five countries where the government was one government after the other was collapsing and that is where uh, the moment ussr collapsed Uh, the entire uh, wind out of the sails went out and both the sides that is the government as well as the rebels agreed to come to the negotiating table which is the first step the moment you come to that and a peace accord is signed uh, rest everything starts unfolding whether it's a ceasefire whether it's a demilitarization that is for both the sides to agree and that is also for the united nations or uh, the party which is brokering peace how much of muscle power they have to go in for demilitarization or just plain cease fire so i think the dynamics again are dependent on the equations between the two parties as well as the third party which is going and brokering peace after that uh, unfold the other uh, stages of uh, the disarmament and demobilization and the integration into the civil society all that happen and uh, whether the war crimes are to be pursued all that happens subsequently but your point is about the demilitarization that can happen only when the two parties agree to it or the peace uh, brokering party uses enough leverage to bring them to a particular point where demilitarization takes place uh, the third issue is about propaganda and information warfare essentially when uh, you start identifying propaganda uh, then people who are specialists in information warfare domain they start analyzing what is the aim of this propaganda is it to test waters is it to damage if it is to damage what segment are they aiming to damage is this propaganda going to yield results or it is already coming to a there is degradation of your particular domain take people's daily or uh propaganda tool is utilized against the indian military how is it used that is to be understood what is the ultimate aim of this propaganda what is the strength of the indian military i think the fundamental strength of indian military is its cohesion so the propaganda is aimed at breaking down the cohesion how do you break down cohesion by propaganda by doing what dividing the officers from the subordinates so you identify that okay this is going to this particular direction can i control it i should have i been able to control it no have they been able to identify that propaganda has now become very serious and there are indications of the net result 
having an impact on the cohesion between the officers and the those whom they lead is there a problem of trust deficit between the political hierarchy the executive and the military that propaganda has it started having an impact if it has started having an impact it is no more a propaganda thereafter is there a divide which has been driven in horizontally and vertically between the civil society and the military you see these cases very often whether you see them in media whether you see them in judiciary but you'll see them very often and that is a good question and uh, you actually forced me to answer this and this is what i want you to understand that propaganda is not mere propaganda it is agenda driven it is goal driven it has to be measured if you know how to measure your cohesion you can definitely measure degradation of cohesion there are enough examples to be quoted there are enough case studies to be studied i think all those who are interested in information warfare and aim to become information warfare specialists must dwell upon it a lot thank you very much sir um, dr deepak is i think referring to uh, the challenges of corruption uh, and how that can impact our efforts towards uh, securing the nation and in this context of course uh, general khandare the anti corruption drive that was launched by shri jingping also very early into <laughs> his tenure but i think he is referring more to the indian context sir, on corruption ami singh uh, i think has two questions within her comments one is on china civil military fusion and um, how india is uh, responding and the second is in terms of china's increasing hegemony in the maritime domain so how can uh, india respond to that i think these are two questions uh, that uh, she has and okay. uh, yeah. go ahead please okay uh, dr deepak uh, regarding challenges of corruption uh, dr venkat mentioned the anti corruption drive uh, which uh, xi jinping launched in china and uh, i think he uh, did it very intelligently he was wanting to reform the chinese military and he used this also to carry out the purge that he wanted and uh, when you have a leader of the stature and the power that xi jinping enjoys there and a parallel structure which is more powerful than the chinese military uh, this could be executed very easily and uh, you see the number of figures they, they are in actually four figures uh, the kind of purges that uh, got carried out uh, the number of suicides that took place where a person uh, felt that his self esteem had been damaged that is about china let's come back to india uh in india uh, the military has its own system uh, where we try to control corruption and uh, within military uh, there are certain uh, offenses which can be dealt under the army act of 1950 there are certain acts which fall under civil offenses and that immediately is handed over by uh, the army chief uh, to the cbi or to the ib to the ib in case there is a connection from across the border and in case there is a corruption case say regarding construction of a building or a construction of a road then that automatically goes into the realm of cbi uh, there is a proper process there there is a kind of uh, it, it's not that uh, suddenly somebody from the cbi will come into a cantonment and pick up somebody there is a central government sanction which is required to do that so there is a balance between Uh, what needs to be done and what excesses need to be uh, prevented uh, when it comes to the civil government uh, how corruption is being tackled you know it as much as i do so i i don't think i would like to comment on that uh, but uh, coming to uh, the question regarding uh, military civil fusion that's how they say uh, even the sequence of letters is important please when you said civil military fusion i wanted to correct it and bring it to military civil fusion because even that makes a lot of sense in the kind of uh, power play that exists in china so military uh, gets a lot of upper hand there i will give you examples of this uh, and i'll then bring you back to india on this uh, in china when you look at uh, the kind of pensions that are paid to uh, 
PLA personnel. Uh, quite a bit of that is paid by the provinces also. That's not so in India. Uh, it is the defense budget which caters for the pensions. Uh, so that is a major issue that you don't have the purchasing power because a lot of it keeps going into your pensions. Uh, the second issue, research and development. A large number of uh, educational institutions there which are funded through uh, the education ministry or any such other ministry, say for example the environment ministry, but the outcome of that is utilized by the military. A large number of military officers take advantage of these institutions for which the tuition fee does not get uh, debited from the defense budget. I think they have found a method where the uh, civil part, the if actually you were to look at the civil domain and the military domain, uh, so much of burden is taken away uh, from the military expenditures and even in the outcome, say if there is a research work which is going on uh, and the outcome of it has to be commercialized as well as hardened and given to the military, uh, that is how it is done there. Uh, what about India? Now, in terms of India, uh, we have a particular weakness that is our silo approach or one vertical not talking to the second vertical even if they are in the neighboring rooms uh, and then that multiplies and uh, aggravates to inter-ministerial issues and what Ambassador Verma had brought out about the difference between the center and the state and the federal structure that we have so there are various challenges and then the approach or the attitude again ambassador verma brought that out that these are central forces and this is a state budget uh, an ideal example i would say how uh, this kind of vertical uh, separation or even horizontal separation does not help the country you look at ncc for that matter ncc is for youth of our country they are our children there are some states which do the funding as per what share they have promised. There are states which just don't bother. Now, in the bargain, it is the youth of your own state which is suffering and youth of the country which is suffering. These are very simplistic examples which I have given. These examples, when taken to a higher level, the border area infrastructure, roads which have to be built by states, roads which have to be maintained by states, railway lines which have to be funded part by states and when that does not happen and the road rail infrastructure does not come up the ultimate loser is the nation because if the roads are not there the military will not reach in fact within the military simplistically said uh, the troops and i am saying it in hindi my apologies to those who do not understand hindi our troops say very clearly to ladenge. if we reach we'll fight you don't reach how do you fight so that is another example of the civil-military fusion which needs to uh, intensify. The current state uh, in the last couple of years, I can tell you, I have been very closely associated with these ministries which uh, the cross-ministerial linkages with the Defense Ministry, the Ministry of Road and Transport, the Ministry of Railways, uh, all of them have actually now been working together. They have integrated now we are coming to a stage where even the Ministry of Rail and Road are talking because Ministry of Defense is telling them, why are you building a bridge? Why are you building two bridges? Why don't you combine that money and build a tunnel? It will be much safer. So those things, I think, uh, and as I said earlier, in a democratic country, there are more questions than answers and there are more delays than propulsion. So uh, those problems we'll have to live with because democracy is the kind of uh, environment that we have chosen for ourselves. But that's not the answer. We all will have to push and we'll have to question people as to why is this being done. And that would be also relevant to the anti-corruption part. Uh, we have so much of activism on social media. We have so much of activism on uh, uh, even in the mainstream media. But that leads to some dangers also. Uh, the kind of activism from the civil society at times creates hurdles for uh, infrastructure development. Like I'll give you a specific example, Chardham Yatra, 
the road which was being or is being built up by the ministry of road and transport and that is the road which is to be utilized by uh, the military to mobilize a uh, pil is put in supreme court by somebody that this is an environmental degradation fine either we protect environment or we protect the nation uh, same is the case with the island territories if environment has to be protected it will definitely not be protected if your enemy comes and plonks himself there so we as enlightened citizens have to empower the government and ensure that uh, we build up our capabilities within the time frame uh, the kind of thought process has also changed earlier we used to compare our performance with what i did in the last quarter what i did in the last financial year now another element has been added to it what has your adversary built in the last one year and what have you built so that kind of a comparison is pushing uh both the civil and military domain and uh, a lot of good people a lot of good establishments of the government a lot of good uh, bureaucrats lot of good uh, ministers are pitching in because that understanding has come maybe a bit too late but it's not lost as yet kandar has been answering questions very patiently and i know sir has to leave he's got other commitments but we'll give the final word to two of the students Uh, Amrita has asked a question. I'll read that out, and then finally Anurup can uh, this thing. Uh, sir, Amrita is uh, talking about these latest uh, reports, public, I mean, open source reports about arms uh, left by the U.S. troops in Afghanistan, and how they are being uh, rooted and discovered in Jammu and Kashmir. How serious is this threat, and what measures are, uh, can be taken to mitigate this? Uh, that is uh, question number one from Amrita. and anurup if you could ask your question uh, briefly and just introduce yourself yes sir good afternoon sir uh, sir i am anurup koshik from the school of international cooperation uh, sir my question is do you think in this complicated uh, security environment it is high time that we come up with a clearly uh, well defined uh, national security doctrine like we have this uh, nuclear doctrine and how does countries benefit from having this uh, uh, national security doctrines thank you sir okay uh, dr venkat i'll take these two questions yes sir yes sir these are the last two questions okay okay uh, from the open source uh, intelligence uh, as available to you we got more intelligence on that as to what was left behind by uh, the americans in afghanistan and uh, obviously uh, any indian would feel worried as to what happens when this equipment finds its way uh, what is the kind of equipment that we feel will come here will the helicopters come no will uh, the tanks come possibly no uh, small arms will come yes possibly shoulder fired missiles will come yes possibly definitely communication equipment will come uh, but let me uh, tell you let's not be so innocent Uh, what is more worrying than these weapons from afghanistan is the kind of drugs that are coming from across the border any uh, terrorist movement or any such movement requires funding that is one secondly they require your people to be drugged they they want your people to get into a kind of a weakness that your future generation cannot stand up and fight that is what we should be actually focusing on Uh, believe me have confidence that uh, the security forces which are there in jnk along the line of control are very capable they will be able to block all these weapons which come there and they will display also they are not going to hide they will display and when time comes you will see that happening but as of now that's not our main worry that is a worry but the main worry that we are seeing the kind of inflow of drugs whether it is from across the international border or whether the drones are being used because the drone doesn't have to be capable of carrying too much of a payload because the volume or the amount of money that can be generated by one drone uh, load is massive so that is what our worry is so uh, while i have answered this but i have drawn another analogy to the kind of threat that we should be focused on uh, anurup has asked about uh, the complicated Uh, security environment and whether uh, uh, doctrine or a document will help uh, 
like it is there in the nuclear domain any doctrine or any document made public will help two people it will help you as well as the adversary so you have to decide uh, what kind of transparency do you want and what kind of a transparency can become suicidal uh, if we want collaboration we want synergy then is a published doctrine the only way or is there any other method that can be adopted behind closed doors and instead of going in for largely publicized seminars uh, which you normally see is a round table discussion closed door confidential a better option uh, is there a case where we have a balance between the two what is published openly is only meant to convey a message like the pakistanis did the national security policy the nsp which they gave out uh, what was the percentage of what was given or hardly anything and uh, while you would know uh, what is given but more important and the work of a genius is to find out what is not given out and if you don't give out anything uh, maybe you are keeping the other side guessing that is one part then why did we do it in the nuclear uh, doctrine because that is a requirement internationally there is a requirement because the whole world does not want to see a nuclear war in that particular region so there you do it but in other domains possibly uh, when you look at pakistan maybe we could have declared but in case of china is it wise to declare so that is something which even the future generation you all need to think more in detail and not get swayed only by the western thought the kind of national power that united states has and then it is able to uh, declare its policy or doctrine is at a particular stage in life the chinese their white paper started coming out in public domain only after a particular timeline that is when you start measuring what is the right time to declare and what is the right time to keep it concealed for a very valid reason not because of inefficiency or incompetence but from a very valid strategic reason thank you anurup and amrita for those questions uh, i think uh, as i conclude i would like to uh, you know quote uh, what general khandare said and i think this is a key uh, take away for all the students and especially those uh, who are the future generations that uh, Uh, enlightened citizens i think it is your duty also to contribute towards empowering the government i think this is the point that general kandare made out of many other very valuable observations that he made which i think we can take off we've had an extremely um, interactive and extremely insightful to us which has passed by without even realizing um i think there is a number of comments uh, general khandare you will see popping up including professor shen who has left a comment about how useful and insightful the session has been and i can't thank you enough sir i know you extremely busy uh, you couldn't do it on a weekday so you took time out on a weekend and i, I believe you are still in office so uh, i want to thank you um, and 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 we are extremely lucky to have general khandare continue to mentor us at the school as our emeritus resource faculty in fact i would say i am guilty that we are, we are not able to utilize your uh, knowledge and expertise a lot more sir uh, because of being stuck with day to day battles here <laughs> but we hope that that situation uh, improves in the future and we are able to take advantage of that so i want to once again on behalf of the university the school our students my colleagues uh, uh pay my gratitude to you sir for the time and the patience you have displayed today uh, i also want to thank each and every one of the uh, participants here uh, some of you are absolute regulars who have really elevated the uh, the discussions that have taken place so much so that there is a lot of uh, feedback i get about how the labard uh, confab on national security has really contributed to the uh, to the discussions and the deliberations and particularly help the students so i want to thank all the participants especially my colleagues who are here i mean i am of course talking but uh, they are the ones who have been doing a lot of work 
um, and 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 behind the scenes uh, and spreading the word. Uh, so I'd like to thank all my colleagues at the school, our administrative office also. Uh, we will continue with these sessions. I think you will hear from us uh, once again very soon, possibly next week. I'm not confirming it right now because uh, I still don't have a confirmation from the speaker who's also part of the audience here. But once I have that dialogue and conversation with him, uh, we will soon have uh, another very interesting discussion take place, possibly late next week. Uh, on 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 a very pertinent and possibly also relevant and very related topic to what General Khandare today has touched upon. Once again, thank you very much, General Khandare, Professor Shen, Ambassador Verma, uh, Mr. Kishore Babu, and and the rest of the audience here. Uh, please have a good weekend, sirs, and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jai Hind. Thank you. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor Shen. Thank you.